Hello lovely people. A while ago I posted a five star book predictions video and now I would like to talk about how I got on with those books. Sophie vlogs. So I originally picked five books that I thought were going to be five star reads for me. Um, I thought I would start with like lowest rated to highest rated and we can work through that way I guess. So two of these turned out to be three star reads for me. First up is uh, Remarkable Creatures by Tracy Chevalier. I buddy read this with the very lovely Olive over at A Book Olive and I think we both had a quite a similar reading experience with this where um, it just wasn't really what we hoped it would be. This tells the story of Mary Anning and Elizabeth Philpot. Both of these were real women who existed, who were involved in this moment of time when fossil hunting really blew up and became a thing and we were rethinking ideas to do with like, you know, how the world was created, what are these, these, these things that we are discovering, stuff like this. Um, this started off really strong for me. Um, I really love the opening few pages. They're talking about this concept of um, people leading with different features and you can tell a lot about a person by what feature they lead with and I thought that, that was a really wonderful concept and it's one that's really stayed with me that I've like thought about with people who I actually know, that sort of thing. Just something about this just didn't really work for me. I think one thing that was quite telling is that as I was reading this I found myself really wanting to read a non-fiction book about these people um, because I really wanted to know more about them but something about the narrative just wasn't quite working for me. I felt like Elizabeth sort of um, I don't know, I felt like Mary was being really portrayed to us as like this innately talented fossil hunter, which I'm sure she was, um, and this sort of thing, whereas Elizabeth in comparison is really given as this like older woman, less exciting. And I, I, I understand that in part that's probably to do with the fact that like Mary Anning discovered these gigantic fossils, whereas Elizabeth Philpot really specialised in like fossilised fish, and there's like a point being made about how we like overlook one of those and don't value it as much. It's just, I felt like, like having Wikipedia, Elizabeth Philpot, she did some really cool stuff. Like she um, invented this way of like um, painting uh, with ink and fossils and stuff like this and all that sort of thing. And I was like, this is fascinating. But I didn't feel like I really got that like fascination with the portrayal of her in here. I don't know, there were things I liked about this. I really enjoyed like discussions to do with like once you discover these fossils and it really um, flies in the face of like the accepted like Christian understanding of how the world was made. Some people found ways to explain fossils that really worked with their um, faith-based understanding of the world's creation. Other people found their faith immensely challenged. Other people stuck to their faith and refused to acknowledge the fossils. Like there were some interesting discussions here to do with to sort of show the way that like the discovery of fossils really did have this big impact and stuff like that. Just, I just didn't feel very connected to the narrative. I just feel like this had a lot of things which if you were to put on paper for me would be stuff that I would really love, which is why I expected it to be a five star read. In reality, just something about it just felt like a bit of a disconnect and I had, I really want to read a non-fiction book, to be honest with you. In the way of historical fiction, I know that she's sort of fudged some timelines and some details and bits like that and actually I just find myself craving the actual real history of these women and their discoveries and of fossil hunting in general. I do have a couple of books on my radar for this that I'll hopefully be getting my hands on soon. Um, there's the dinosaur artist, there's uh, two more that I can see the covers of but I cannot tell you what they're called. <laughs> Visual brain, am I right? So yeah, this is not a bad book and I think that for a lot of people this will be a wonderful book. So um, I wouldn't want to put you off of reading it if it sounds like something you're interested in because I, I do know a lot of people who love this book. It just didn't really work for me and I felt disconnected and I was a bit disappointed. <laughs> the next book that I gave three stars to was Graceling by Kristen Cashaw. This one, to be honest with you, I really wasn't sure whether to rate it three stars or four stars and a reread might bump it up for me. The reason I picked this for my five star predictions is because I read and loved um, Jane Unlimited by Kristen Cashaw, even though I only gave it four stars <laughs> when I read it. I don't know, my ratings are a bit wishy-washy at times, let's be honest. Jane Unlimited had some really fabulous concepts and ideas that it was playing around with, so I was really interested to see what her doing a fantasy series was like. This follows Katza. We are in this world where some people have a grace, and a grace is like um, your sort of like innate magical ability type thing, and Katza has the grace of killing. Her uncle sort of really exploits her. He uses her to intimidate people he wants to intimidate, to get things he wants to get. She's really kind of like, almost like a hired gun, except that she's not hired and she doesn't really have a lot of choice in the matter. A very important old man is kidnapped. Katza decides to investigate. She also decides that she no longer wants to kill. She doesn't want to be used in this way. 
Um, her investigations sort of lead her on this journey along with this guy called Poe, and the the story sort of like continues from there. Um, I liked a lot of stuff about this. I had a really fun time reading it. I raced through it very quickly. It wasn't quite as fast-paced as I had expected. I found it very readable, but um, the plot in many ways is quite like, we go to this place, we do some things here, we go somewhere else type thing. Um, also, I think the main thing is, is that I didn't feel super surprised at a lot of things that happened. I kind of expected them. So, like, there's a romance in this, and I really enjoyed the romance, it was really, really lovely, but equally, like, I felt quite confident that the romance was going to happen. Similarly, um, because Katza's grace is such that she is quite formidable, there were moments of, like, danger where things were quite tense but I kind of felt secure in the knowledge that she was going to be okay because she is so strong and stuff like this. Um, there were definitely moments where um, the presence of other characters is what made things tense because it's like, well, Katza might be okay, but what about this person? That sort of thing. So that definitely, it's not like I was never tense. Um, I think just this combination of kind of being able to sort of see what was going to happen and then um, not having so much fear is what made me sort of lower the rating a little bit. This is definitely one of those where I think there are a lot of really great threads in here. There were real moments that really like got me. There's a whole portion about being at sea which I really liked um, and there were a lot of side characters that I found really great. So it's one of those where I have a lot of affection for this and maybe on a reread I would bump it up to a four. I think I will continue with this series. Number one they've got those beautiful covers coming out that I think are gorgeous. Um, number two like I have affection for this, I enjoyed enough of it to want to know what happened in the rest of this world. I think maybe on a reread, because I won't be, it won't matter so much that I kind of know what's going to happen, because obviously I do, because I've read the thing, um, so that won't really bother me so much, so I think I'll just be able to enjoy it for what it is, rather than being a little bit like, um, you know, knowing what's going to happen, and I don't know. Two of the books I gave four stars. Both of these are on like a very similar level, so like don't take this as me liking one of them more than the other, I'm just picking up the one that's on top of the pile. <laughs> Um, this is Freshwater by Okwiki Amezi. This follows Ada growing up in Nigeria. Um, later, as the plot develops, she moves to America for college. This was such an interesting read, and it is really unlike anything I've ever read. It's a work of fiction, but now that I follow Okwiki Amezi on Twitter, I did see them uh, tweet about how actually like so much of this is just autobiographical. It's just um, the accepted form of publishing it was as fiction, because it's discussing stuff like... I'm going to call them alters because that's what the blurb calls them. But um, essentially it's like gods that exist within Ada. So there's Ada themselves and then there are these different uh, altars um, who have different personalities and stuff like this. And the narrative is told from different perspectives. So um, there's a perspective that is uses we pronouns, that is um, multiple gods talking together. There is every now and then you get Ada. Um, there's also um, alters that develop later that are quite dominant, that take um, portions of the narrative as well. So it was a really interesting narrative structure. One thing I found when reading it is that sometimes, because of how dominant certain voices are, occasionally I felt disconnected, like I felt a little bit disconnected from Ada, because you don't get her voice very much. And equally, some of the other alters that I was really interested in, again, because they're not so dominant, you don't really get it from their point of view. I think at times, this sort of like slightly disordered ordered, like, fragmented way of telling this story, um, at times I was like, oh, I wish it was, like, a little bit more, like, you know, linear, that sort of thing, but that's, like, it's such a weird thing to apply to, like, someone who is essentially telling you their life. Like, your experience of your life is not, like, this orderly, linear thing. It's this thing when people try and write their life story where you're trying to, like, impose order um, to create, like, this beautiful linear storyline thing. Whereas this is dealing with a lot of topics that are messy. It's dealing with, like, ideas of gender, of neurodivergence, of trauma, and these are things which are not, like, linear, tidy, narrative things. These are things which are messy, and this, this structure that I think when I was reading it occasionally I felt a little bit disconnected from at times really like number one we're echoing Ada's own disconnect with themselves um, and then also like really is that not an authentic way of telling your story to show it to you in this this way that reflects how it how it was lived I don't know this is one that I think since I finished it um, I've been it stayed with me and it's given me a lot to mull over 
um, I found it really interesting in the end. Definitely one again that I will reread at some point, because again, I think a reread will draw a lot more out of it. Um, I do want to read everything else that Akwaki Mezzi has written. Um, Pet is one that's very much on my radar, but pretty much everything else also, yes please. So yeah, this is one that I think felt very raw, it felt very unique, and I'm definitely really glad I read it. Potentially another one that will go up upon a reread, we'll see. But um, yeah, one of those that I've had, that sitting with post reading has really helped me like assess how I feel about it. The next four star book is the reason that this video is really late. So this is Blood in the Mist by Hope Merlees. It took me a while to be in the mood to read this book. Essentially, I read the other four books very close together because I was like focused. Yes, this is a fantasy novel that was published in 1926 and it's very much harkening back to like an older time. This is sort of fey fantasy. Essentially, Blood in the Mist is this town that exists at this intersection between these two rivers. One of them is a normal river, the other one um, starts in fairy. So fairy is like a real place, um, and the people in Blood in the Mist, um, they sort of um, created this um, world for themselves that is very based on like law and order. They don't tolerate fairy fruit, they don't tolerate fairies, um, this was very influential on Neil Gaiman writing Stardust, and I really see that. A lot about how Blood in the Mist feels, it kind of feels like, um, war. And I can really see the way that, like, sort of this, um, portrayal of both, um, fairy and also, like, what being a human living alongside fairy is like really influenced, like, how he created war. There were some other, um, sort of comparisons that struck me as well. The story follows Nathaniel Chanticleer, and the Chanticleers are a family that have lived in London the Mist for a very long time. Um, he essentially, in his youth, heard this note on this old harp thing, and it's kind of haunted him, but what's haunting him is like this slightly nebulous concept. It's almost to do with like the concept of like the passing of time and loss and stuff like this, it's all epitomised within this note. So instead he builds this life for himself that is very couched in like routine and um, not rocking the bow and that sort of thing. As this book unfolds, essentially someone is smuggling fairy fruit into Lud, and shenanigans are ensuing. Two other comparisons I have for this, which just really struck me as I was reading it. One of them is Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell, specifically in regards to, like, the very, like, ordered society that feels very based in, um, the time, with this sort of fey that is very other, that has its own rules, and that sort of thing, and this meeting of the two, um, which is again ties back into Stardust with this place that is like liminal space where there's meeting of the two, that sort of thing. There's very much um, uh, mulling over here of like this intersection of these places um, and what happens if you shun one because it's almost like Blood in the Mist is out of, it's, it's out of balance because they so solidly shun the Fae. And that was really interesting. The The final comparison I have is The Count of Monte Cristo, and that's because The Count of Monte Cristo is very much about um, Edmund Dante's, like, um, his plan of revenge against the people who have wronged him. And there is an aspect in this of um, Nathaniel being the subject of someone's schemes and machinations who has it out for him. So those are like my three like comparative points that for very different reasons but are just things that I thought of when I was reading this. The reason that I needed to be in the right mood to read this is because it's written in 1926 and it's very much harkening back to an older time. So it's set in a much like an older society, almost like Victorian type thing. And the writing sort of taps into that. So it was the writing style itself that the first couple of times I picked it up and I read like a page, I was just like not in the mood for that style of writing. I'm really glad I waited because I actually had a really fun time reading this. So this is not a fantasy where you go off and you have these amazing fantastical adventures. It's in many ways a fantasy that is quite rooted in reality, but with these elements of fae. And I loved how the fae were. It is like this very like traditional, like from folk tales concept of fae. And I loved that. And I loved the descriptions of the fantastical things to do with the fae and that sort of thing. So on the whole, this was a book that um, I'm really glad I waited. I've obviously just finished this one compared to the other ones that I read a while ago, which is why I'm able to talk about this, I think, in a little bit more depth, because I did take quite a break from reading this. 
Um, but in the end, I've had a really good time. It's really interesting to read from a point of view of like looking at like foundational fantasy writing. It's really interesting to read from a point of view of like fae narratives of people being spirited away, of the corruption of fairy fruit, stuff like that. A little bit Goblet Market in that respect for sure as well. Um, another comparison, William Morris, his early fantasy, stuff like that. So there's a lot of um, in conversation with other texts that I felt like I had with this, but I also just appreciate this for what it is. So I really enjoyed this actually, and I'm really pleased that I waited to read it at a point where I did enjoy it. So the final book I have to talk about is the only one of these predictions that I actually did give five stars to. This is The Stone Sky by N.K. Jemisin. It is the third and final book in the Broken Earth trilogy. I loved it. Um, I know people who've read this trilogy who didn't love this conclusion, but that is not the experience I had. I had an amazing time and it made me want to cry. Broken Earth trilogy is uh, focused in this world that has seasons. Um, the fifth season is when usually like this cataclysmic event happens. It takes different forms each time, but it is like um, then humanity sort of has to just like endure to get through it. There are people called Orogenes who can like control stuff to do with like rocks and the ground and stuff like this. Um, by this point, we've gone some places. I will attempt to do this in a spoiler-free manner. <laughs> Things I adored about this. The narrative, I finally understand the second person narrator and the conceit that is happening there and realising who is our narrator. Really, I loved that moment. Um, I love so much of what this is exploring, like I really feel like at the at its heart this is a series that is looking at our relationship with the earth, obviously. It's putting it in a sci-fi context but it's, it's what we're doing. And um, she makes this very valid point that like the earth does not need us to live but we do need the earth. And um, concepts being explored in this like exploitation, both like humans exploitation of the earth, humans exploitation of other people. Um, and all these sorts of things. I feel like she's really tackling some really big things, in, but I love the way that she goes about it. And um, one scene that really got me in this is like this concept of like motherhood, especially in like two characters' specific relationships. But I also love that it's kind of a messy version of motherhood. Like the there's a there's a mother daughter characters within this and their relationship is not good but it's so compelling to read about and the ways in which people try and they might be doing the wrong thing when they're trying but they're trying um i don't know i just feel like this is dealing so much with like trauma and love and humanity i just don't know if i'm actually capable of describing everything i loved about this <sighs> which makes this a fucking pointless video does it but this is where we're at this is often like a heavy read at times because it's dealing with these like really big concepts and stuff like that um and also you're getting a lot of like um world building and like terminology used and con like that sort of thing like you're you get a lot of real real background information here that explains stuff like the stone eaters and stuff like this but i think what i really loved is that like at the heart of it there's these really like human emotions to do with like even when people are being angry and hurt and all of this sort of stuff a lot of the time it all comes kind of comes back to love essen is heavily motivated by like love of her daughter however that manifests it is what it is um Nesson is heavily motivated by like a lot of really messy messy complicated emotions but they all come back kind of to like love that she has for someone and that sort of thing i don't know i just i felt like there was just so much going on in like a grand scale so much going on in like a innate emotional state scale um this is another one that definitely i feel like a reread is going to be in order like especially um knowing how everything ends to then go back and read it all from the beginning i think will be really interesting i just i'll stop because i'm rambling and i'm doing that thing that i do where i just say i just a lot and i flap my hands about like a little chicken but i loved this series the first book managed to really like excite and surprise me the second book i thought was really good i didn't love it as much this one sort of really brought me back to that feeling of like oh my god <laughs> you know i don't know i just loved it so this was actually the only five star book among this five star prediction reflecting upon the concept of predicting five star reads i think i was valid in predicting 
all five of these books might be a five star read. I think the reasoning I had behind them is all entirely fair. I think in some cases there's like an element of like expectation versus reality. Very much with Remarkable Creatures, that's a book which on paper I should love but in reality just didn't quite work for me and that's totally fine. Others I kind of picked with not a great amount of foreknowledge, like Freshwater. I didn't really know a lot about Freshwater, I just knew that a lot of people loved it and I really like queer books so I thought it's probably going to be good and I did really enjoy it. Um, stuff like Blood in the Mist, um, definitely a lot of my buzzwords here, like fey fantasy, early fantasy, stuff like that, definitely had a really great time reading it. I think this one ended up being the only one that I gave five stars to, because a lot of the time for me, like a five, st the difference between a four star and a five star is often just a gut feeling. You know, like, these were both four star reads, I could talk enthusiastically about these till the cows come home, for sure. This is the one that really got me in my soul, you know, and sometimes that's the difference for me. I've definitely been more generous with five star ratings in the last year or so, I think. I, sometimes you know when you're like, wavering between the two, I have a little bit of a tendency, a slightly more tendency now, I think, to just be like, screw it, let's give it five stars, why not? Um, because I, I feel like star ratings reflect how I feel at the time. They may not stand the test of time, like there's frequently books that I look at my Goodreads red shelf from like ten years ago and I'm like, do not feel the same way about that book now. <laughs> but that's fine, you grow as a reader, you change as a reader. I think the process of trying to pick five star reads is still an interesting one because it involves looking inward and identifying things that I love and then um, trying to find things that fit that, and if that doesn't actually live up to the rating, it's still fine, because I still had a really fun time, like, reading the book, assessing the book, and that sort of thing. So, um, I might do another predictions video? Let me know what you think. Do you think that would be interesting? I definitely had an influx of books since <laughs> I did this one, like, a year or more ago. So um, there's definitely a pool to choose from. I also think I have different things that I'm looking for in what I'm reading, so, you know. Um, yeah, let me know your thoughts. Let me know if you've read any of these. I'd really love to hear your thoughts on any of them. Otherwise, I'm going to wrap it up because I don't feel like we've necessarily been the most concise at points in this. <laughs> but um, this has been really fun to do and I hope you're having a lovely day and I will see you next time for something different.